Hey everyone, it's Classic DM, and I thought we would go back in time to about a year or so ago and revisit the classes from AD&D and get into some more advanced discussions about them. Let's kick things off with the one class that's probably the most underrated, most underappreciated, but is absolutely a gotta have it class in the whole game. Do you know which class I'm talking about? Let me just give you a quick little look at this, right? So, you know, every berserker or fighter or paladin or no matter what game you're playing, this is their dream, right? So they're standing here, they're doing something, their friends are off doing junk in the background, and then a bunch of enemies attack. And they're thinking, I'm going to 1vx all these scrub orcs, or I'm going to 1vx these enemies, and I'm going to start doing all these attacks and doing all this damage and moving around. I got high armor class, I got great bonus to hit. You know, we're talking about AD&D &D terms here, not Pathfinder terms. And that's their fantasy. Their fantasy is to utterly obliterate huge packs of enemies, which is totally awesome. But you can't really do it very well without this guy or with this girl. Now, what am I talking about? Well, you know, we're talking about the cleric. So in this episode, we're going to talk about cleric from a low level. And we're going to talk about cleric, this Tomoshan pre-generated cleric. And we're going to talk about the, cler the cleric at high level. And we're going to look at this going back to our player's handbook and just kind of talk about some of the subtlety nuances. So we're not going to run through all the spells and all the things you can do. But we're going to talk about the cleric a little bit high level here in a little bit more detail to give you some tips. You know, if you're going to go back and try to play AD&D &D you never played before, you haven't played in 40 years, there's a lot of things about playing the cleric that you got to remember. And there's some things that I always felt that were kind of overlooked that people didn't actually play them that way. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. So one of the things you're going to find uh, right off the bat about playing a cleric in, in AD&D &D is that uh, they're underrated in terms of what they can do in terms of melee. All right, that's, that's kind of a silly statement, but if you go look at the... Um, if you look at the actual to hit tables for, for the cleric, right? Let's just pull this up real quick. You get the first upper left one here. This is for clerics and druids and monks and things like that. Let's just zoom that in a little bit. And let me pan that over so you can see that a little bit. So let's get this like this. Let me put it back like that. Back like this. Here we go. So if you look at the cleric table here, let's say your to hit AC zero number starts off from level one to three at like 20 okay so if you're fighting stuff like orcs and junk you need if you're hitting ac6 stuff you need a 14 and a 12 for levels four to six then you're gonna need like a 10 so even like a level seven cleric okay go back to the shrana to motion a level seven cleric really only needs to hit ac6 a 10 that's a 50 percent chance to hit so let's just give you a sense of what that looks like right let's just say this cleric let's say here's a warrior fighting an AC6 orc, and here's a cleric fighting an AC6 orc. And neither one of you have magic items. Now, <clears throat> let's say that the warrior is using a long sword, right? They just put somebody up here with a sword and shield and a long sword as opposed to putting the guy with the two-handed sword up there, the berserker girl from P Pathfinder. Um, so, you know, let's compare the to hit numbers right off the bat. So if you look at the fighter table down below, let's say they're both level seven. The base roll chance to hit AC zero for a fighter is 14. The base roll to hit at level four, uh, level seven for a cleric is 16. So that's only a difference of basically like 10%. So these two are relatively close. The fighter's going to hit a little bit more frequently. The cleric's going to hit more frequently, uh, hit pretty frequently as well. Well, let's compare that to say a thief, right? Let's just swap out the fighter for the thief. So that thief, his table is the lower right-hand corner. Say you have a level 7 thief. Their range band is levels 5 to 8. He needs a 19. So a 14 versus a 19. A level 7 thief here, level 7 cleric, hitting the same, let's call it a chumpy orc with AC, AC 6, right? AC, let's do AC 0, like we were talking about a moment ago. He, the, the level 7 uh, thief needs a 19. The level 7 cleric only needs a 16. So clerics and this is the cleric and druid and monk table which is very interesting because a monk is kind of a dpsing melee class but you would think of a cleric you always think about casting heals and casting cure light wounds and casting augury and all this other kind of junk right and casting shield and all these other type of stuff you don't think of the cleric as a melee class but if you actually look at the to hit tables they can melee quite well now a lot of the weapon choices they have are relatively limited mostly all one-handed items but you can use a flail Right? They're not dual wielding or anything. They're only just using single wield weapons because dual wielding is kind of a house rule thing in AD&D. &D. But if you compare that to a thief, the thief has a tougher time hitting something than a cleric does. Now, if you compare that to, let's get a magic user illusionist up here. Let's get the thief out of the way. 
Let's go take a Magic Loser Illusionist. Level 7, to keep it all that levels being equal to AC 0, needs a 19. So a level 7 Illusionist, okay, lower hit points, lower armor class, needs a 19 to hit AC 0. Level 7 Thief, lower armor class, okay hit points, needs a 19. Now think about a Cleric. D8 on the hit points, only needs a 16 to hit AC 0. So they're basically on par with a fighter, paladin, ranger, and a bard, right? So that's pretty crazy if you think about it. And even like zero level humans, if you if you really look at the table, zero level like guards at some city gate. A guard at the city gate is going to use the one point, the one dot B table attack matrix for fighters, paladins, rangers, and bards, and zero level halflings and humans. So if you think about just just from the perspective of whacking something over the head. And all things being equal, and rolling a D8 with some, you know, weapon, two-handed, a single-handed weapon to hit, your cleric is right up there with the fighter. So, with that in mind, think about what else you can do. Well, let's look at the armor. The armor the cleric can wear, the hit points the cleric can wear versus the thief and versus the illusionist. Let's group them together. Say, you know, the 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 whole the thief and the assassin they're on one table right and the magic user illusionist on the other table so the armor and the hit points this these guys are a huge disadvantage but they do a ton of damage so these are what we call like a dps machine so these are really dpsers if you know your mmo lingo so the fighter pure damage good resiliency dps tanking if you want to call it tanking there's no taunting or anything in DD. so where does the cleric fit in well we need to be survivable so we don't want to get killed so where should you position yourself in a big battle Let's make it a nastier battle. Let's talk about positioning, and then we're going to go over to the player's handbook real quick and take a look at some stuff. Let's pull up these girls here. So when you think about playing a cleric, you aren't really playing a healer like you would in WoW running an instance or something where you kind of need to stay in the back and like running a priest or a druid or a paladin healer like in World of Warcraft. It's very different in D&D. In AD&D, you're, you can be, you're very, very tanky. Um, you can help a frontline fighter. Well, let's put this fire giant guy here. Here we go. Fire giant dude, right? He's coming to get you. You and two-handed fighter. Let's get this junk out of the way here. You and two-handed two fighters going for it. Clear, let's get the fire out of the way. Move a little closer here. There you go. You're right on your grid. No one's cheating. <laughs> Two of you are going for this guy. By doing that, you can block the travel point of this fire giant so you can't get through this area. So you're creating a block here, right? And if and if things are really great, that then gives you a frontline situation for ranged people like your casters and stuff a chance to attack from the back. So when you think about, you know, what can you do as a cleric is go clog up path of travel so this is one rule that people don't think about you can clog up path of travel also the range for casting your heals is really really short so who are you going to be healing well whoever's taking the massive melee damage most of the enemies in ad and d with the exception of the ones that are really nasty spell casters are going to do nasty melee damage um, and those are the ones that you're going to want to be able to heal quickly the person with the hugest amount of hit points with pretty darn good armor you're right in the front line there with them you know, you can reach over and cast a heal on them. There's no attack of opportunity in AD&D unless you house rule it in. This is where you probably need to be. Now, some people might say that, oh, but you could get spell interruptions. And there are rules in the DM's guide about being spell interrupted. That's fine. But in a basic kind of dungeon situation, um, that's a really good place to be. Let's look at this from another perspective. We're talking about advanced cleric mode here. And this, this applies for druids too, right? Let's turn this camera over here a little bit. And let's look at this choke point in this building here. Let's get this ugly microfiber out of the way. Let's say this bad boy is trying to get into the building. You got your illusions here in the back casting. You know, where's your cleric need to be? Right up here in the front. Here's your fighter. Now, if you have two fighters, sure, let them both get in the front and let your cleric get in the middle where he's not going to get hit. Maybe the cleric's off to the side so you can heal and come over to the side and heal, things like that. So the cleric can rotate. You want that cleric in this front line area here. And the cleric's not going to take any damage. Um, the cleric can also blow, save all the heals and do some meleeing until they take some damage and take a step out and swap out and off tank with another, ta another, uh, fighter. Um, this is something you would never do in EverQuest or never do in an MMO oriented game. This, you know, if you have a druid that's a caster centric druid, the druid can be in the back casting spells. The thing you don't want to have happen is you don't want to have like the monk in the front line or you don't want the thief in the front line. They should be flanking and attacking from behind to take advantage of armor class penalties and things like that to do lots of damage. This is one thing that's very tricky about playing the cleric, depending upon the play style of your group, is are your glass cannons, your your assassin and thief and your monk good at positioning themselves 
so they don't get damaged and don't end up like this where you can't get there in time to do anything to heal them because you're going to need to run right over them and touch to cast heals. Let's just take a look at one of the heals real quick here. I'm going to pull up this other. We'll put the landscape version of this document here, right? And we'll come back to the, the spells in just a minute. Let's go find our uh, cleric spells. We'll just control two and get that big again. So cleric, let's just say we're doing... Uh, Let's say we're able to cast Cure Serious Wound, right? Level 4. This is the way down here. Cure Serious, serious Wounds, right? So let's go down there and find Cure Serious Wound. We'll do a control left for this. Cure Serious. Thirty-one instances. It'll get to it. So let's get to the spell. There's the list. There's the list. Here it is. So Cure Serious Wounds right here on the left. Range, touch. This is one thing about playing the cleric or any kind of healing in AD and D is there's no ranged healing. So it's not like World of Warcraft where you're gonna wind up a spell and target someone or roll life bloom and rejuvenation or anything. So the MMO world makes things much easier. In the MMO RPG computer game world, everything is much more. Um, you know, healers are weak and they get focus fired, and tanks are really strong and powerful and snare people, and DPSers are really hard to kill and have a lot of evasion and parry and dodge. The, the, the basic Trinity kind of vibe isn't really there in AD&D. You need to forget this idea of having a Trinity when you're playing AD&D. But when you're playing a cleric, let's go back to our wide view camera here. We'll close this little panel down here. When you're thinking about playing a cleric, if you find yourself in a situation where you know this big fire giant's coming along, and let's say in the background, I'll put this across the street here. Let's say in the background, you've got a fighter and a druid pinch healing and helping fight over here and let's say you've got a fire giant here and you've got a thief coming in from behind to attack like this and you got a monk maybe back in the back with a thief and you got a frontline fighter and here's an illusionist y'all this group here is probably gonna have no problem if you got a druid and another fighter in the background back over there i'll give you a quick overhead view what that looks like just so you can see so you got like a battle happening here and a battle happening over here where should you be you're the cleric where should you be as long as this fire giant is focus firing this warrior and that warrior, you know, a fighter and it has really good armor class, you should be okay. So what I'm talking about then is this gal here. So as long as he's focus firing them, but at a moment's notice, if he decides to turn, this you aren't going to DPS something down in two hits. That's one thing that happens in AD&D. It's very rare to have a monster drop in one hit from a regular fighter trying to kill them. And there's no real taunting. There's no skills except for like 3.5 to like you know, aggie them to attack you or taunt them or aggro them. So you have to watch out for that. So if you're over here thinking you're going to protect the fighter, if the DM's really nasty, he can have that fire giant turn to so he's going to swipe at one of these characters in the back. And by that, I'm talking about we've got a, a you know, we've got a monk and a, a, a thief or assassin in the back. So as a dungeon master, one thing you can do to make it interesting is kind of make the AI kind of tricky. Here's what I would do as a DM. So the party comes up. Let's say that these guys were hidden in shadows and he didn't see them. Fire giant sees you, comes rushing forward. You know, fighter takes a step forward and blocks, engages. Illusionist gets herself a line of sight, going to wide a prismatic spray or whatever she wants to do. If you're the cleric, you're like, okay, I can get up here and melee a little bit. And then maybe your thief pops out of the shadows from moving silently, starts to backstab. And maybe your monk comes in here from this angle here and starts doing a lot of damage. Now, if this guy wants to turn and start jackhammering your monk... This monk is the most fragile thing on your list. So as to cleric, what are you thinking about? Who's going to die fast? You don't need to be positioned here. You need to be over here. You can even be over here doing melee from the side to prevent him for, to be able to turn and heal that monk right away. Now, the monk in AD&D has the fastest movement rate of any class in the game. It's twice. It's 24 inches. It's faster than anyone's movement rate in the game. But when you're thinking about where you need to be, you need to think about two things. I can take a hit. I have great armor class. I hit just as good as a fighter. I should be meleeing. I should be swinging away. But I want to make sure I'm meleeing and doing damage and also watching out for the rambunctious classes, okay, that are, that I even had this guy try to blow past and go straight for this illusionist if he does something. You know, how am I going to, how are we going to prevent that from happening? Now, when you're AD&D game, your DM is probably going to not allow that fire giant to move past this opening. This is an opening in a doorway. But you need to think about what the enemy does. 
when you're DMing the game, one thing you should do to make it fun for your players is have the fire giant ta change targets and tactically try to move into the other positions and maybe back himself into a corner and use kind of the human behavior thing so everyone's thinking about where they are. Because one thing you wouldn't, one thing you would love to have happen is like what well, started off like a fight like this, but then things started turning and then he took a step forward. Now he's over here and he's fighting the monk and I've got a thief and a, and a fighter out of position. I'm right next to him. So I could start nailing him, maybe keep the monk alive while maybe the thief tries to zip around and f to attack from the behind the, and behind the illusion just goes this way. So you kind of need to think about where you are. So let's slow that down a little bit. Where do you want to be? Right? Where do you want to be as a cleric? In my opinion, you should take advantage of your fact that you have a really good chance to hit. Let's get everyone out of the way here and clear this board off real quick. You have a really, really good chance to hit. You're going to have a shield. You're going to be wearing plate mail if possible. You know, you aren't going to get any penalties for doing that. If you're a druid, you're much less armor class. Do not be afraid to go up and start whacking on something, right? Do not be afraid to be the second person to go up and start whacking on something once you're a fighter or paladin or ranger or what have you, usually the paladin or the fighter, had the attention of an enemy, especially if they have good armor class. Two-handed fighter is really more of a DPSer. Once someone has a shield on, I'll drop the armor class by another number, plus two shield, drop it down by two. So don't be afraid to be there. Don't play your cleric like a healer in an RPG. Think about what your advantages are and take advantage of that. Now let's, you know, let's go look at our player's handbook real quick and refresh our memory about what some of the details are about this class that you need to always keep in mind. So I'm going to go ahead and flip that to the page first before I switch it over for you. All right, here we go. Let's go back to that page. We'll put that on this. We'll turn this panel on here for you. So being a cleric is cheap doesn't cost anything all you have to have is a minimum wisdom of nine right 13 if you're multi-class half elven cleric if you're a by the book kind of a player and if you get a, a wisdom higher than 15 you're going to get that 10 percent experience bonus over a year ago we did a video that kind of walked through and talked through all these kind of details right you know if you're rolling up a cleric and you've got a 16 wisdom you know you want to put everything else in constitution or maybe dexterity dexterity is a really good one because it lowers the armor class i'm a bigger fan of not getting hit Versus having lots of health. So if you add a chance to like assign your statistics somewhere, your ability scores, you know, go for something like that. The spells that you have, you know, the key concept is right there. Fortify, protect, and revitalize. A lot of the heals you have, they're not strong enough to save someone's life. You're doing things like turning undead. You're the bane of undead. If you have a bunch of undead start attacking, run up in the front and start destroying these things. Do what you can. You're going to be harder to hit. You're not a big DPSer, but you can occupy things. So your positioning of where you are is really going to make a big difference. Also, another thing that happens, if you see this down right here, it says right here, clerics have as nearly as good a prospect of success in melee as combat as fighters, and the best in such situations. This is something a lot of people forget. You play in the modern world, you play a lot of MMOs and stuff, you forget that this class is really viable, very viable for, uh, and they make great saving throws against magic and poison, attacks and so they're really really strong in fact if you want to play a safe class that isn't going to die often but doesn't do big hits and isn't going to crush the devil out of something cleric is really really powerful you could have a an entire group that's no fighters in it and just have clerics it's going to take longer to hit things but no one's really going to drop especially if you focus on all your magic items to protect you so you know potions the clerics use potions they can use most rings some wands rods staves uh, staves those are great magic items that you'll find in the dungeon master's guide that'll give you the ability to do some special magic user oriented type abilities and find traps um, all they have to do is just non-edge non-pointed magical weapons so you're looking for maces and flails and all that kind of stuff you can look that up in the player's handbook yourself the thing, the rule that they have in here about, you know, star attracting followers, that's not something I ever did in our campaign. You can do that, read about that. Every one of the classes has all these, like, attracting the followers kind of things as well. So um, the thing about the cleric, though, you know, is they don't, get, you know, you say, say you're, let's, let's, in fact, let's just look at a, let's look at um, Antola. Antola is an epic overpowered cleric from our Glacier Rith Frost Giant, Charles Daddy Hill Giant Chief, you know, max hit, max hit points, negative four AC. And he's using a plus four flail and a plus four kite shield. Nasty, we're in plate mail. So he's got plus three plate mail, a necklace of, um, a necklace of order of protection. He's got some scrolls of extraction, like total epic artifact level, Tomb of Horrors quality cleric. Most people aren't going to have a cleric like that. He's intentionally fabricated to work in the show, right? Most people don't have a cleric that's going to be that powerful. They're going to be learning around like 53 hit points if you roll the hit points. But even at that, if you look at the spell table here, right? You're level 10. 
this is how many spells you get, right? Four first level, four second level, three third level, three fourth level. And then when you actually go to the spells and start thinking about which spells do you want to use, which ones are actually effective for you, you may find that a lot of cleric spells aren't that amazing. Let's just take a look real quick. Level one, bless, and it's a buff. Command, that's pretty interesting for like kobolds and stuff. Create water, somewhat useful. You can be very creative and use create water to make you know torches go out. Cure light wounds, that's only a 1d8 heal. Detect evil, that's really useful. You can be you can detect evil for a long period of time and determine what's behind the door, what's here, what's there. Detect magic, really useful to determine if an item that seems very unique and special and powerful has got magic to it. Light, really useful, no I'm using torches. Protection from evil gives you a buff. Purify food and drink. Yeah, well, you know, if you find a bunch of nasty food. And it's, a lot of DMs don't use a lot of like, you're hungry and you're, you're getting disease. Remove fear, really useful. And some, some of the enemies in the monster manual will do fear. Resist cold, eh, it's okay. You're fighting frost giants or something, that's all right. Sanctuary is nice. Uh, augury is more like a predict what's going to happen in the future. We're looking at second level spells now. Um, chance, interesting, but it ties you up. Detect charm is kind of not that useful. Find traps is great. So a level, you know, if you're a cleric, you have floor slots at level 10, right? Most of the time you're going to pick like hmm, silence, 15 foot radius, and whole person and things like that. Some of the spells like no alignment, like they don't really come in handy very often. If you're doing a big city adventure, like the uh, city state invincible overlord, you might find that no alignment's great for interacting with kings and dukes and things like that. And you got resist fire, which is really just like a level one spell all over again. Slow poison to prevent you from dying to death, like in the hidden shrine of Tomoshan, and that comes in handy. Speak with animals is a really, really inventive, very creative spell. You can use that to talk to wolves, and soon they're not trying to kill you. Spiritual hammer is okay. You know, if you'll notice, a lot of the spells in the cleric um, repertoire, we're gonna say the spell book, or, you know, they aren't offensive oriented. They're much more about protecting, figuring things out, doing interesting things that are kind of. Uh, passively helpful they're not like you know nuke from orbit type spells they get things like flame strike which is nasty at level five you know but things like tongues and true seeing speak with plants exercise divination they get things like blade barrier and earthquake much later later but level at level 10 you know you're gonna have like you're gonna get like level five when you get to level five spells that's where you get like slay living and things like that those are really really nasty so um cure serious wounds or fourth level so the spells overall for a cleric at low levels as you're playing, so you level one, two, three, four, you do the Village of Hamid or the Temple Elemental Evil, or you're playing, uh, I don't know, the Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh, or you're playing the Shrine of Tomoshan, you find that most of the spells you have are kind of like somewhat useful. It'd be very odd to have like, you're going to use Glyph of Warding or Locate Object or Feign Death. A lot of the old modules do have a lot of situations where you can't find this magic item and it's very frustrating to try to find it and, and locate object can come in handy for that. But remember, think of it this way. You're kind of like this tanky fighter that does mild melee, one-handed melee damage. They're going to you know, maybe do 1d8 with a mace or something or a morning star. Isn't going to take a lot of damage. Needs to be close to touch people to heal them. And your other spells are used kind of like in non-combat situations or right before combat. Like you cast protection from evil, ten foot radius, a level four spell, you know. And then later on, you're having this weird situation. You're moving through a forest, and you want to. You're tracking down a bunch of hobgoblins or ogre magi. You want to speak to plants, or you want to speak to animals and talk to birds to figure out where they went through here. Or you detect lie. You know, those are the kinds of spells that are very useful for the overall campaign and adventure. But when you're in a dungeon, running around fighting. You don't have a lot of moment-to-moment -moment combat spells are useful, except for whole person. <laughs> Silence 15 radius and whole person are probably the nastiest, like shut something down right away, especially if there's another caster. Anyway, so you could read the spells yourself and figure that out. But the one thing I wanted to kind of share with this video is that don't let your modern-day sensibilities of what a healer is, um, even in the other games, you know, taint your perspective of what you can do as a cleric in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons because the uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons um, cleric is really, really a different animal, a completely different animal than anything you've ever seen. I think the one thing I noticed over all the time that I played over the years is you don't have a lot of people uh, people playing a cleric that are brave enough to get in the front lines. They think their melee damage is piddly. If you think about it, the melee damage of every class in AD&D is piddly. Uh, they, you know, you're not going to get a lot of bonus system strength to damage. Even 17 strength is what, plus one, plus one, or something like that? Let's just look at, how about Vrinjar? What does he got? 
Azalaris, right? Plus 16. At 16 strength, he's only plus 1 damage. I think Mercedes had 17. No, she's 16 as well. How about Tomoa Sean? Here we go. The Ryle the Wanderer. 17 strength. Plus 1 to hit. Plus 1 damage. So let's just show that up for you, what I'm talking about. So there's this character sheet, right? So you don't have a lot of bonus to damage in AD&D. &D. You have bonus to hit for magic items, like a plus three sword, and it's going to do plus three damage, etc. So you're going to get, like, the best case scenario is someone has some plus five Vorpal sword. It's going to be, that's going to be it. You, you, someone with, with 18 OO strength and a Vorpal sword, maybe they're going to get plus eight damage. They're not going to do, they're going to do double damage on a 20, which is what I always like to do. But most of the game... The damage output of the players is not that high. The damage output of the monsters is not that high. But some of them are very have a lot of resistances, a lot of str strange magical mythical trickery about them. Um, they can do a lot of damage really quickly. The party's a little weak. You know, we have kind of crappy armor class, kind of low hit points if you play it by the book. Um, so you really have to work together. So if you are a cleric, focus on getting plate mail. Get the big shield. Get a flail or morning star in your hand. Be prepared to get close to do touch heals on people that need to be healed. Think like a cleric. Don't think like a healer. So that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. It's, it's something I was talking to a buddy of mine the other day, talking about Pathfinder 2 and Pathfinder 1. He was talking about his D&D 5 edition game. And he was talking about, yeah, you know, we need a healer, we need a cleric. And people playing WoW Classic and stuff. I was like, wow, the... the uh, the cleric in D and D is just tremendously different. Tremendously, it's just not even the same type of creature, you know. And a lot of people underestimate that. So, think about those things. Implement that kind of play into your game when you're playing a cleric, and play to your strengths. Don't skip out on your strengths. You can tank. <laughs> you have great armor class. You have great hit points. You got great, decent one-handed melee damage. You have good healing. Not awesome, good healing, and good utility for figuring out stuff in the campaign. Okay? So we'll leave it at that, and uh, we'll see you again next time. We'll talk about the Druid next. Sound good? All right, cool. We'll talk to you later.